morning, darlings. So the first section then, this is the second video in the series, the first section is ideas about narrative. Now, in case we're not clear, we better ask the question and we better answer it as well. What is a narrative? So a narrative is either a spoken or a written account of connected events, i.e. a story in, in the form of or concerned with narration. This is also, it's like, it's, it's to do with how a story is told and it must be, it's usually the whole story. So this is why it's important for us to look at that, look at this first before we look at anything else from the critical anthology. That's why they've put it as no, at number one. So ideas about narrative then, and we'll scroll down just a little here. I really like this magnifying glass. Section one then, ideas about narrative. This section contains extracts that explore some of the methods writers use to construct stories. Now, when we talk about methods, we usually think about things like metaphors and similes and personification and pathetic fallacy. But this can include all sorts of things. More than that, deeper than that. It can be anything such as surrealism, um, an unreliable na narrator, an allegory, um, intertextuality, repetition in a text, uh, the weather, which is your pathetic fallacy, um, time shifts. And I know that at least two of you are doing books to do with time. So that might be something for you to look at. Um, Defamiliarisation, um, using interior monologues in a piece of work, um, the ending and how it ends, um, the beginning and how it begins. Um, any surprise that isn't foreshadowed, for example, how to introduce a character, all these different things, and there are plenty of them that are included in a narrative, is about, are the methods used to construct the narrative. It's how writers manipulate structure and language to tell their story. It's about what you find out and when and how they do it, essentially. Um, we just look at deeper methods here at A level than we did at GCSE. So stories for many are seen as being fund of, of fundamental importance to human life. Um, man has always liked to tell stories. That's why we still know about the Greek myths from thousands of years ago. And we still know about the Egyptian gods and goddesses and, and stuff like that, you know that's why we still know about it because man likes to tell stories human humankind not just men mankind uh booker begins to explore the idea that there are commonly recurring story types that can be traced throughout all literature david lodge whose book i hold in my hand called the art of fiction which is extraordinarily useful and if you want to have a look at my copy, you can. But if you want to get your own, when I bought mine, I think it was only a, a couple of pounds or so on Amazon. Um, really useful book. Um, he's written extensively about narrative and he really knows his stuff. And here there are extracts related to how writers start and end their narratives, how narratives are, how narratives are structured and told and how time and setting are used within stories. It's not just enough to recognize that they are there it's to analyze and critique their purpose to analyze their purpose what's it for and to critique it how well was it done how did it contribute to the ideas or themes in which it which the the novel or the prose piece was trying to discuss convey etc for many readers the uh, characters are the most important and memorable aspect of a story OK, fine. And there are some ideas here about the crucial element of characterization. In focusing on the story and its structure, some writers also focus on the gaps in the narrative, the parts of the story that aren't told. Ideas about narrative gaps are specifically included here as they can be very fruitful areas of investigation and exploration especially for those students that's you guys interested in producing recreative pieces that was something i spoke about in the first video which often focus on what is silent missing or not explained in the text in more modern 
work pieces of work. I'm not entirely sure there's a lot of mystery anymore. There used to be quite a lot of mystery, but I'm not sure there is anymore. But maybe I'm just reading the wrong books. Maybe there's some books I haven't discovered yet that have got loads of mystery in them. Maybe I should just read more. Okay, so little side tangent there. Sorry, guys. Um, so story types then. So if you hear a funny noise in a minute, it is again the dog who should be somewhere else and not bothering me. Uh, story types taken from the seven basic plots, why we tell stories by C. Brooker. So here, this is a literary critic. And this is a sample from C. Brooker's work. So it says... Imagine we are about to be plunged into a story, any story in the world. A curtain rises on a stage, a cinema darkens. We turn to the first paragraph of a novel. A narrator utters the age-old formula, once upon a time. On the face of it, so limitless is the human imagination, so boundless the realm at the storyteller's command, we might think that literally anything could happen next. And this is quite true we wouldn't really read things like game of thrones we wouldn't read things like 100 years of solitude we wouldn't read things like narnia and stuff like that if we didn't believe that anything could happen next but in fact he says uh, brooker says um there are certain things which we can be pretty sure we know about our story before it even begins for a start it is likely that the story will have a hero or a heroine a protagonist or both, a central figure or figures on whose fate our interest in the story ultimately rests. Someone with whom, as we, can, as we say, we can identify. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we've got something in common with them. It just means we follow their journey all the way through. We are introduced to our hero or heroine in an imaginary world. Briefly or at length, the general scene is set. The purpose of the formula once upon a time, whether the storyteller uses it explicitly or not, is to take us out of our present place and time into that imaginary, imaginary realm where the story is to unfold and introduce us to the central figure with whom we are to identify. So the beginning of every story, there, there must be some mechanism there to take us from our own reality into the reality of the book. And if it's done well, we are immersed in the narrative, immersed in the story, and we find that we can't put it down and we sit and read for three hours and then we finish the book and then we've got nothing else to do with the rest of our day. Or maybe that's just me. But the idea that Brooker says is that we, we, have, to, we have to be able to uh, be willing to surrender to this possibility before we even enter into this discourse with our text. Because otherwise, we wouldn't get out of it what we should, essentially. Uh, so he says that, Brooker says then, then something happens, some event or encounter which precipitates the story's action, giving it a focus. In fact, the opening of the story is governed by a kind of double formula. Once upon a time, there was such and such a person living in such and such a place. Then, one day, something happened. This is true. Because it's, it's very rare that you will find a text where not a lot happens. It's very rare because people don't engage with it. Because think about the reason why we turn to books, why we like reading, why we turn to films, why we like watching them. It's a form of escapism. It's not only to learn and build our brains and strengthen them. It's a form of escapism. We like being taken to other places and uh, face different scenarios and be presented with different ideas. It's a form of escapism. So to have nothing happen wouldn't engage a reader very much. So we are introduced to a little boy called Aladdin who lives in a city in China. I was in a pantomime called Aladdin when I was about 10 there is a video. No, you're not seeing it. Uh, then one day, a sorcerer arrives, one day, just one random day, and leads him out of the city to a mysterious underground cave. We meet a Scottish general, Macbeth, who has just won a great victory over his country's enemies. Then, on his way home, he sees the weird sisters. He sees the, the mysterious witches. 
we meet a girl called Alice wondering how to amuse herself in the summer heat. And then suddenly she sees a white rabbit running past and vanishing down a mysterious hole. And whoop, she follows him and falls a million miles. And she meets the Queen of Hearts and the Cheshire Cat and all the and all those dudes and the croquet and, and the, the Mad Hatter and all that tea party stuff. We see the great detective Sherlock Holmes sitting in his Baker Street lodgings. Then there is a knock at the door. And a visitor enters to present him with his next case. The event or summons provides the call which will lead the hero or heroine out of their initial state into a series of adventures or experiences which, to a greater or lesser extent, will transform their lives. And we, the reader, go on the journey with them. That's why we read books. The next thing of which we can be sure, Brooker says, is that the action which the hero or heroine are being drawn into will involve conflict and uncertainty because without some measure of both, there cannot be a story. Again, much like where there's nothing happening, if we can predict what's coming next, we're not going to be engaged. What's the point in reading something where we know what's coming up? What's the point? Where there is a hero, there may also be a villain, or on some occasions, the hero himself might be a villain. But even if the characters in the story are not necessarily contrasted in such a black and white terms as goodies or baddies, it is likely that some will be on the side of the hero or heroine as friends and allies, while others will be out to oppose them. So these are the protagonists versus the antagonists, etc. We've done this. You know about this. So finally... He, it, Brooker says, we shall sense that the impetus of the story is carrying it towards some kind of resolution. Even when, even every story which is complete and not just a fragmentary string of episodes and impressions must work up to a climax where a conflict, uncertainty are usually at the most ex extreme. So a climax is like the turning point. And then this then leads to the resolution of all that has gone before, bringing the story to its ending. And here we see how every story, however mildly or emphatically, has in fact been leading its central figure or figures in one of two directions. Either they end, as we say, happily, with a sense of liberation, fulfilment and completion, or unhappily in some form of discomfiture, frustration or even death. So these are sort of, this is quite a black and white um, formula. And not all novels follow it specifically, but Brooker says that we are, we, we are expecting these ideas. We know they'll either be something really sad at the end or really happy. So he, there, then Brooker says, goes on to say, to say that stories either have a happy or unhappy endings may seem such a commonplace, it's such a commonplace, that one almost hesitates to utter it, but it has to be said simply because it is the most important single thing to be observed about stories. Around that one fact, sorry guys for the pop-up, uh, around that one fact and around what is necessary to bring a story to one type of ending or the other revolves the whole of their extraordinary significance in our lives. We go on them, their journey with them through this little section of their lives, but that's all we know about them. Unless, of course, it's a massive series and we follow them from birth to death or whatever. But we follow them through this little series, this little period of time in their lives. If you hear a weird noise, it's the dog. Okay, Brooker then goes on to say, one of the few general texts ever to have been written on stories was Aristotle's Poetics left unfinished well over 2,000 years ago. And it was Aristotle. And if you don't know who Aristotle is, you probably should by now, but go and do some research. <coughs> who first observed that a satisfactory story, a story which, as he put it, is whole. Remember, we talked about that with the, the whole story must be in the narrative. Must have a beginning, middle and an end. And it was Aristotle who, in the context of the two main types uh, of stage play, first explicitly drew attention to the two kinds of ending story it may lead up to. So, on the one hand, as he put it in the poetics, there are tragic stories. There are, these are stories which the hero or heroine's fortunes usually begin by rising, 
but eventually turn down to disaster. And you will look at this when you look at your tragedies, your classical tragedies. So those are your Keats poems and Othello. So um, the Greek word for catastrophe it literally means a downstroke. The downturn in the hero's fortunes at the end of the tragedy. On the other hand, there are, in the broadest sense, comedies. Stories in which things initially seem to become more and more complicated for the hero or heroine until they are entangled in a complete knot from which there seems no escape. Now, Shakespeare wrote quite a few comedies. And if you don't know them, you should look them up. Some of them are brilliant. Twelfth Night, my favourite. Go and watch it. It's fabulous. But eventually comes with what Aristotle calls the peripatia or reversal of fortune. The knot is miraculously unravelled from which we get the French denouement. Can't pronounce that. French is not my thing. Sorry, guys. Meaning literally an unknotting. Hero, heroine or both together are liberated and we and all the world can rejoice. Midsummer Night's Dream is quite like this as well. If you haven't watched those two plays, you really need to. They're amazing. This division holds good over a much greater range of stories um, than might be implied just by the terms tragedy and comedy. Indeed, with qualifications, it remains true right across the domain of storytelling. So whether they realise it or not, even modern writers will follow this sort of map, this blueprint, because that's partly because they maybe don't want to write anything else, but perhaps mostly because this is the, sto the sort of format their stories that they've read have taken and so they don't know any other way in which to write. So, um, the plot of a story is that which leads its hero or heroine either to a catastrophe or a knotting, either to fr frustration or liberation, either to death or a new one of life. And it might be thought that there are almost as many ways of describing these downward and upward paths as there are individual stories in the world. Yet the more carefully we look at the vast range of stories thrown up by the human imagination through the ages, the more clearly we may discern that there are certain continually, rec continually recurring general shapes of stories dictating the nature of the road which the hero or heroine may take to their ultimate decision. This is what I've just said. Because people are so accustomed to the format, it, it must be extremely difficult to break down those barriers and write something different. Because one, how would they go about it? And two, could they be sure that anybody would want to go on that journey with them? Because before people open up a book, before they sit down and get the popcorn out and watch the film, they are expecting all these things that Brooker has said. So these are some interesting things for you to think about. When was the last time you wrote, you um, read a book that was written differently than one of these formats? Answers on a postcard, please. Joking, obviously, you can tweet me. Right, so, <clears throat> structure. Now, this is taken from the book I hold in front of me, The Art of Fiction by David Lodge. It's a great book. Absolutely love it. It's full of sticky notes because I have read it. I've even, <clears throat> even, sorry to say this, turned down a few of the uh, the old corners. Sorry, guys. But yes, okay, so structure. structure. The structure of narrative is like the framework of girders that holds up a modern high-rise building. You can't see it unless you are watching it be built, but it determines the edifice's shape and character. The effects of a novel structure, however, are experienced not only in space, but over time, often quite a long time. And he says, does David Lodge, that Henry Fielding's Tom Jones, not the singer, not the singer, Henry Fielding's Tom Jones, for instance, which Coleridge thought had one of the three greatest plots in literature. And if you don't know who Coleridge is, you need to research him as well. He wrote poems along with Wordsworth. Um, the other two were both plays, Oedipus Rex, brilliant play, and Ben Jonson's The Alchemist, also a fantastic, fantastic play. And if you haven't read them or watched them, you should. I do realise that at this point your list of things to do is longer than your arm, but it's worth it, I promise. And it runs to nearly 900 pages in the Penguin edition. It has 198 chapters divided into 18 books. The first six of which, the first third, are set in the country. The next six 
are set on the road and the last third are set in London. And exactly in the middle of the novel, most of the major characters pass through the same inn, but without meeting in combinations which would bring the story to a premature conclusion. This must have taken some intricate planning. So this novel is packed with surprises, enigmas and suspense and ends with a classic reversal and discovery. And this is a great book if you haven't got it. If you, if you want to look at mine, please just ask. It's absolutely fantastic. So again, we're taking from David Lodge here, Beginnings. He says, for the reader, however, the novel always begins with that opening sentence, which may not, of course, be the first sentence the novel orig novelist originally wrote. Lord knows people chop and change and copy and paste and rework stuff all the time. And then the next sentence and then the sentence after that and then the sentence after that, etc., etc. When does the beginning of a novel end is another difficult to qu a question to answer. Is it in the first paragraph? The first few pages, the first chapter. Is it the first few chapters? When does the beginning of a novel end? Need to think about that. It's interesting. However, one defines it though. In the beginning of a novel is a threshold separating the real world we inhabit from the world which the novelist has imagined. It should therefore, therefore as the phrase goes, draw us in, which is what we were saying before in the previous um, section. A novel may begin with a set piece description of a landscape or townscape that is to be the primary setting of the story. The maison scène is, a, as film critics uh, term it, for example, the sombre description of Ed, uh, Egdon Heath at the beginning of Thomas Hardy's The Return of the Native or E.M. Forster's account of Chandra Poor in Elegant Urban Guide Book Prose at the outset of A Passage to India. Uh, a novel may begin in the middle of a conversation like Evelyn War's A Handful of Dust or Ivy Compton Burnett's idiosyncratic works. Um, it may even begin with an arresting self-introduction by the narrator, Call Me Ishmael, Herman Melvie's Moby Dick, or with a rude gesture, the literary tradition of the autobiography. The first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all that before they had me and... Uh, all that David Copperfield kind of crap, but I don't feel like going into it. And that's from The Catcher in the Rye. Um, a novelist may begin with a philosophical reflection. The past is a foreign country. They do different things differently there. Uh, that was Hartley's The Go-Between. Or pitch a character into extreme jeopardy in the very first sentence. Hale knew they meant to murder him before he had been uh, in Brighton three hours. Grey and green, Brighton rock. 100 Years of Solitude does the same thing. And if you haven't read that book, you should. It is the best book ever written. Many novels begin with a frame story, which explains how the main story was discovered or describes it being told to a fictional audience. In Conrad's Heart of Darkness, an anonymous, remater, an anonymous narrator describes Marlowe relating his Congo experiences to a circle of friends sitting on the deck of a cruising yawl on the Thames estuary. And this is also Marlowe begins, uh, and this also Marlowe begins, has been one of the darkest places of the earth. That again is a fantastic book and you should read it. Uh, Henry James's The Turn of the Screw consists of a deceased woman's memoir, which is read aloud to guests at a country house party, who have been entertaining themselves with ghost stories and get perhaps more than they bargained for. Uh, Kingsley Amis begins his ghost story, The Green Man, with a witty pastiche of the Good, Fortune, uh, the good Food Guide. No sooner has one got over one's surprise at finding a genuine coaching inn less than 40 miles from London and eight from the M1 than one is marvelling at the quality of the equally English fair. Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveller Begins, you are about to begin reading Italo Cal uh, Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller. So that's interesting. Uh, I've never seen that before, that particular book, but it's it's a good book. You should read it. James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake begins in the middle of the sentence. River Run, past even Adams, from Swerve of Shore to Bend of Bay, brings us by a commodious uh, vicus, vish, uh, 
vicus of recirculation back to house castle and, and envions. The missing fragment concludes the book. A lo uh, away alone, a last, a loved, a long the. And so it's a cyclical structure, a bit like Blood, Blood Brothers is. Uh, so it thus returns to the beginning again, like the recirculation of water in the environment from the river to the sea to the cloud to the rain to the river, and like the unending production of the meaning in the reading the fiction. So you're supposed to continue and continue and continue. Cyclical books are rare, but fabulous. And you should all read at least one in your lifetime. So the art of fiction from David Lodge is taken again when we discuss endings, conclusions, are the weak points of most authors, George Eliot remarked. And quite a few people, when we're writing stories in class, often say, oh, miss, I don't know how to end it. Miss, I don't know how. How do I end my story, miss? And it's, a, it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult. Who, who amongst you can say with honesty, hand on heart, that you were able to end your stories brilliantly without any trifle, any trouble, any worry at all? Probably not many of you. Uh, but some of the fault lies in the very nature of a conclusion, which is which is at best a negation. To Victorian novelists, ending were apt to be particular tr particularly troublesome because they were always under pressure from readers and publishers to provide a happy one. Victorians liked happy endings. The last chapter was known in the trade as a wind up, where everything winds winds up. Not where you play a practical joke on somebody. Which Henry James sarcastically described as a distribution at the last of prizes, pensions, husbands, wives, babies, millions, appended paragraphs and cheerful remarks. James himself pioneered the open ending characteristic of modern fiction. Uh, often stopping the novel, novel in the middle of a conversation, leaving a phrase hanging resonantly but ambiguously in the air. In the air. Then there we are, said Streffer. And that's it from the ambassadors. Ending a novel is difficult. And the cyclical nature of some is um, not necessarily an easy out uh, because it probably serves a, 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 a bigger point. But leaving a novel halfway through a sentence must be extremely frustrating for a reader. And as Jane Austen points out, uh, pointed out in a metafictional aside in Northanger Abbey, a novelist cannot conceal the timing of the end of the story as a drama dramatist or filmmaker can, for instance, because of the telltale compression of the pages. So you know when the ending is coming because you've only got a couple of pages left. Whereas films, not necessarily, they can get away with stuff like that. And on the, the on the stage on the in the in the theatre they can get away with the curtain falling without us knowing about it, but we know when the end of a book is approaching because we know that we we can feel it. It is a tangible thing that we haven't got that many pages left. When John Fowles provides a mock Victorian wind up to the French lieutenant's woman or lieutenant if you're pronouncing it properly, in which Charles sets down happily with in. Ernestina, and no, before you ask, that is not my name. We are not deceived for, um, for a quarter of the book remains to be read. Going on with the story of Charles's quest for Sarah, Fowles offers us two more alternative endings, one that ends happily for the hero and the other unhappily. And he invites us to choose between them, but encourages us to see the second as more, authentic, more authentic, not just because it is the sadder, but because it is more open with the sense of life going on into an uncertain future because not everybody in life gets a happy ending. So time then also taken from David Lodge. We may as well just read this book. You may as well just read it. It's very good then. Um, the simplest way to tell a story equally favoured by tribal bards and parents at bedtime is to begin at the beginning and go on until you reach the end or your audience falls asleep. I'm not sure which one that's referring to. But even in antiquity, storytellers perceived the interesting effects that could be obtained by deviating from chronological order. The classical epic began in media res, in the midst of the story. So halfway through. 
For example, the narrative of the Odyssey begins halfway through the hero's hazardous voyage home from the Trojan War, loops back to describe his early adventures, then follows the story to its conclusion in Ithaca. I am in the process of reading The Return from Troy by Lindsay Clark, which is a modern adaptation of the Odyssey. And it's just fantastic. It follows The War at Troy, again by Lindsay Clark. And they are just brilliant books. And I know you've got a million books to read already, but if you haven't read these books, you absolutely should. And you should also read Stephen Fry's Mythos to go with it. Absolute fantastic. Uh, through time shift, narrative avoids presenting life as just one damn thing after another and allows us to make connections of casual, uh, casuality and irony between widely separate events. It makes the reader think more than just about the words in the sentence on the page. It makes us link stuff up. It makes us consider, and this is what you want your readers to do if you are an author. If you are an author... You want your readers so submerged into your, into the world that you've created, into your novel, that they are able to recall and remember things from 40 pages ago because you are on a tangent now that references that and you are deviating from the chronological line. Writing it is a challenge. Reading it is fun. Okay, so a shift of narrative focus back in time may change our interpretation of something which happened much later in the chronolo chronology of the story, but which we have already experienced as readers of the text, or vice versa. This is a familiar device of the cinema, the flashback. Film has more difficulty in accommodating the effect of flash forward. The anticipatory glimpse of what is going to happen in the future of the narrative, known to classical... Uh, Rhetorican, rhetoricans as prolepsis this is because such information implies the existence of a narrator who knows the whole story and films do not normally have narrators unless of course it's one with morgan freeman in which case he can narrate away okay it is significant that this uh, that in this respect the film of the prime of miss jean Brody was much less complex and innovative than the novel on which it was based. TV series are easier, they have a much easier way of doing this than films do because they can um, give you a, a flash forward of several episodes in the future. By the time you actually get there, you may have f forgotten what was going on. I'm thinking specifically of the West Wing here. In season seven, the president, President Bartlett goes to open up his presidential library and there was a scene at the beginning where he meets several of his staff. And, but it omits a detail. It doesn't tell you which president is coming. So it doesn't tell you who exactly, who exactly won the race that was being um, run, ran, run, when he was still in office and he was coming to the end of his eight years. So TV series have an easier time of this, but film struggles. Um, so the film told the story in straightforward chronological order, whereas the novel is remarkable for its fluid handling of time, ranging rapidly back and forth, forward over the span of the action. So it's, it's hard to follow, and this is where you probably get your sticky tabs and your highlighters, perhaps, but it is fun. Setting. Again, from The Art of Fiction by David Lodge. Uh, the sense of place was a fairly late development in the history of prose fiction. As Mikhail Bak uh, Bakhtin observed, the cities of classical romance are interchangeable backcloths for the plot. Ephesus might as well be Corinth or Syracuse, for all we are told about them. The early English novelists were scarcely more specific about place. London, in Defoe's or Fielding's novels, for instance, lacks the vivid visual detail of Dickens' London, which we've all read because we read um, A Christmas Carol. When Tom Jones arrives at the capital in search of his beloved Sophia, the narrator tells us that he was an entire stranger in London, and as he happened to arrive first in a quarter of the town, the inhabitants of which had very little intercourse with the householders of Hanover or Grosvenor Square, for he entered through Gray's Inn Lane. 
So he rambled about for some time before he could even find his way to those happy mansions where fortune segregates from the vulgar of those whose ancestors being born in better days by sundry kinds of merit had entailed riches and honour on their posterity. London is described entirely in terms of the variations of class and status in its inhabitants as interpreted by the author's ironical vision. There is no attempt to make the reader see the city or describe its sensory impact on a young man from the country for the first time. Compare, though, this to Dickens' description of Jacob's Island and Oliver Twist. And if you haven't read Oliver Twist, you know what I'm going to say. You should read it. It's brilliant. To reach this place, the visitor has to penetrate through a maze of close, narrow and muddy streets thronged by the roughest and poorest of the waterside people. The cheapest and least delicate provisions are heaped in the shops. The coarsest and commonest articles of wearing apparel dangle at the salesman's door and stream from the house parapet and windows. He walks beneath tottering house fronts projecting over the pavement. Dismantled walls that seem to totter as he passes. Chimneys half crushed, half hesitating to fall. Windows guarded by rusty iron bars that time and dirt have almost eaten away. Every imaginable sign of desolation and neglect. These two are much different. This one's just about location and this one is absolute detail. Absolute detail. Dickens was really very preoccupied with the plight of the poor after his trips to the Manchester um, the workhouses up there and desperately wanted to challenge people to change the ways so this is why he incorporated such in-depth descriptions into his work and why not it worked in Christmas Carol Tom Jones was published in 1749 and Oliver Twist in 1838 so five years before Christmas Carol what intervened was the Romantic movement. So you guys know about the Romantics with capital R's because we've done a little bit of it with Keats, uh, which pondered the effect of milieu on man. I opened people's eyes to the sublime beauty of landscape and in due course to the grim symbolism of cityscapes in the industrial age. Don't forget Romanticism, capital R, is a preoccupation with the beauty of nature. Martin Amis is a late exponent of the Dickensian tradition of urban Gothic. He, his fascinated and appalled gaze at the post-industrial city mediates an apocalyptic ver vision of culture and society in a terminal state of decay. As with Dickens, his settings often seem more animated than his characters, as if the life had been drained out of the people to re-emerge in a demonic, destructive form in things like streets and machines and gadgets. That's an interesting thing. So if you've got a particular setting that is of importance or seems to take on a life of its own in your, in your books that you are studying and that you're going to answer questions on, this is the sort of stuff that you need to be looking at to be able to support or challenge your arguments in your essays. The same can be said for all the other things we've looked at. If they have a particular one of those features to challenge or support your ideas for your book, this is where you come for a couple of quotes to support or challenge. Narrators, again from The Art of Fiction by David Lodge. Unreliable narrators are invariably invented characters who are part of the stories they tell. An unreliable, omniscient narrator is almost a contradiction in terms and could only occur in a very deviant experimental text. So if you didn't know what an omniscient narrator is, it means they are all seeing and all knowing and third person usually. Uh, even a character narrator cannot be 100% unreliable. If everything he or she says is palpably false... That only tells us what we know already, namely that, is a, uh, that a novel is a work of fiction. There must be some possibility of discriminating between truth and falsehood within the imagined world of the novel as there is in the real world for the story to engage our interest. We always have to be concerned if we are writing something with how we are going to engage the interest. We cannot be... It's not even that we can't be beyond belief of the reader, but we have to have characters which are reliable in order to give us the re in order to give the reader 
um, a sense of accuracy when reading. Uh, so, okay. The point of using an unreliable narrator is indeed to reveal in an interesting way the gap between appearance and reality and to show how human beings distort or conceal the latter. So how we um, distort reality or how we conceal it. This need, need, this need not be a conscious or mischievous intention on their part. The narrator of uh, Kazuo's it issue... Oh, I can't say this word. I'm so sorry, guys. Ishirigo's novel is not an evil man, but his life has been based on the suppression and evasion of the truth about himself and others. His narrative is a kind of confession, but it is riddled with devious self-justification and special pleading, and only at the very end does he arrive at, the, at an understanding of himself too late to profit by it, by it. So it could be that your narrator is unreliable, but is on a journey to become then reliable. Uh, again, with, uh, we're looking at, uh, we're now we're going to look at characterization, and this is not taken from David Lodge. This is by Porter Abbott, H. Porter Abbott, from the Cambridge Introduction to Narrative. So it says, ever since the distinction between character and action in narrative was first introduced over 2,000 years ago, theorists have tended to give priority to, uh, of importance to one or the other. For Aristotle, it was quite clear that the action, the incidents or events of a story took precedence over character. And he said, character gives us qualities, but it is in our actions, what we do, that we are happy or the reverse. In a play, accordingly, they do not act in order to portray the characters. They include the characters for the sake of the action. So that it is the action in it, i.e. its fable or plot, that is the end and purpose of the tragedy and the end is everywhere the chief thing. For Leslie Stephen, writing in England at the end of the 19th century, and if you don't know who these people are, you can look them up. The balance was just the reverse. The great object of narrative action was the revelation of character. Stephen was a man of his time and place and became in 1881 the first editor of England's Dictionary of National Biography, whose founding was itself highly symptomatic of this shift in emphasis. The first of its kind, the DNB, was the narrative equivalent of England's, England's National Portrait Gallery, for in Stephen's words, a biography should be a portrait as reveals the essence of character. So this was the equivalent for the biography of, of important people. Um, so a third position, though, is that character and action are inseparable. Stephen's commentary, uh, Stephen's contemporary, God, I can't read, sorry, guys. Stephen's contemporary, Henry James, argued that no one could learn the art of novel writing by learning first to make characters and second to devise the action. Characters and action were finally indistinguishable, intricately involved with one another, melting into each other at every breath. What is character but the determination of incident? What is incident but the illustration of character? It is an incident for a woman to stand up with her hand resting on a table and look out at you in a certain way. Or if it be not an incident, I think it would be hard to say what it is. At the same time, it is an expression of character. How one acts determines one char one's character and one's character determines how one acts, essentially. It is hard to deny the logic of this, though. And he's got a point, I think, because like, when was the last time you saw somebody with a look on their face and you knew what they were thinking? And because of their character and what they were thinking, that determined the look on their face, for example. Just like the woman with her hand and, and, and resting on the table. So, it is hard to deny the logic of this. And so far as the incidents involve people, how those incidents play out is driven by the nature of the people involved. Characters, to put this in uh, narratological terms, have agency. They cause things to happen. Conversely, as these people drive the action, they necessarily reveal who they are in terms of their motives, strengths, weaknesses, trusted, trustworthiness, capacity to love, hate, cherish, adore, etc., etc. So, we see their motives and their personality and all the rest of it by their actions and vice versa. 
So flat and round characters. Now, this is not talking about somebody who's had a massive accident, I promise. Again, we're looking at H. Porter Abbott. And he says, E.M. Forster introduced the term flat character to refer to characters who have no hidden complexity. If you've read Twilight, think of Emmett. If you haven't read Twilight, where have you been? Jokes. Um, in this sense, they have no depth, hence the word flat. They are 2D, essentially. Frequently found in comedy, satire and melodrama, flat characters are limited to a narrow range of predictable behaviours. <clears throat> Examples can be found throughout the novels of Dickens, flattened further by refrains, motifs, like Barkis is a willing that sum the character up. The philosopher Henry Bergson speculated that we laugh at such characters because they represent a reduction of the human to the mechanical. They're no longer a full human. They're just one level. Whether he was right about this or not, such characters do seem to exist on the surface of the story along with objects and machines. There are no mysterious gaps to fill since what you see is what you get. We know some people in life like this as well, actually. I can think of at least three that I know and I'm sure you guys know some as well. They declare themselves in their motifs as if to say, to borrow a motif from Popeye the Sailor Man, who's another 2D character, I am, I, I am what I am. He, he knew what he was. That was it. That's all we ever saw. And if you haven't seen Popeye the Sailor Man cartoons, I genuinely don't know what you've been doing with your lives. So, Forster's counter term to flat characters were round characters. Now, this is not somebody who's been eating too many Mars bars, too, much, too many Twixes. Round characters have varying degrees of depth and complexity. And therefore, in Forster's words, they cannot be summed up in a single phrase. They are complex characters, just as most human beings are complex human beings. They don't just have one priority, one level of working, one... Um, aspect to them they have many many layers in ralph ellison's novel invisible man for example the round central character takes apart popeye's signature mo to motif i am what i am um using it to evoke his own conflicted relationship with his african-american cultural heritage of which yams are both a powerful symbol and an actual component the point of yam and i am is in turn one small component in a complex web of conflicting ideas, feelings and values, out of which we, the reader obviously, along with the invisible man, try to put together an understanding of his character. We're supposed to go on this journey with him, which links to the bit um, above actually about finding out what they are at the end in order so that they then may go on and be better, but we don't see it because it's at the end of the book. Um... It is, the interest of, it is the interest of this sort of complexity that has led many critics to rank round characters above flat ones. They see them as more interesting, better, more important. And though flat characters can be awfully funny and satire can provide focus and bite by reducing a target to a flat character, the complexity of round characters seems closer to the way people actually are. Which is true. We can't not say that. We can't say even, you know, even the dullest of people on the planet have layers. Um, okay, so narrative gaps then. Narrative gaps. We're going to take this bit from the Cambridge Introduction to Narrative by H. Porter Abbott again. Narratives, by their nature, are riddled with gaps. Unless you are going to tell a 40,000 page size 8 text novel story you are not going to get everything into the the between the, the the front cover and the back cover of that character's life it is difficult and so there are gaps even if we come as close as we can as we humanly can to avoid under reading and over reading we still have things to fill in if we are to make sense of the narratives as we read or see and then we've got a quote here so it says that night we lay on the floor in the room and I listened to the silkworms eating. The silkworms fed in racks of mulberry leaves and all night you could hear them eating and dropping a sound and a dropping sound in the leaves. In these first two sentences of Hemingway's short story, Now I Lay Me, a number of gaps open up. Where are we? Why are we lying on the floor? What do silkworms actually sound like when they eat? 
And what is a dropping sound? Is it like the sound of rain? Why can't or won't the narrator shut out the sound of the silkworms? If he, is it he, listens all night, why is he staying awake? What's the point? Even though we were given this really quite nice... This is a nice piece of writing. This is a lovely sentence that we could analyse that. There's plenty of methods in there. You know, we, we, could, we could say quite a few of things that we know. We are still left with all of these questions. We are left in terms of lines with more questions than we have answers. There are uh, one, two, three, three. Uh, we've, got more, we've got more lines here than we have here in terms of questions. So that's quite significant. But these are the things we need to think about when we're reading any novel, never mind the one that we're doing for A-level coursework. We need to think about all these things so that we can argue for our whichever ism we're looking at, whichever part of this anthology we're looking at. We just need to ask these questions to make sure that we're getting as much out of any novel as we can, because otherwise, what's the point in reading? So as we read... The narrative discourse gives us some guidance for filling in these gaps. We learn that the narrator is recalling a time when he was convalescing seven miles behind the lines from a few historical markers and the fact that his orderly is an Italian who was conscripted when he returned home. We infer that these lines are the Italian front during World War I. We infer from the fact that they were lying on blankets spread over straw that the narrator and his orderly are in a makeshift ward in a structure house, which is like a, a, a barn, in a structure which could be a house or a barn appropriated for the use. This isn't a proper hospital. But much of these inferences, insofar as we build them in our minds, are constructed from what we know or imagine of houses and barns in Italy in the second decade of the 20th century. We never receive any more information on the sound of silkworms eating, except that it is different from that of guns in the distance. So if this gap is going to be filled in, we must use what we know or imagine about the sounds of things dropping on leaves. And why can't he sleep? We learn a reason for this in the next two sentences. So somehow, sometimes the questions we have are then answered later on, but it doesn't mean that we don't need to be asking them. Even if we think we may find out the answer, it does not mean that we don't have to be asking the questions. Always, always ask the questions. Uh, I myself did not want to sleep because I had been living for a, a long time with the knowledge that if ever I shut my eyes in the dark and let myself go, my soul would go out of my body. I had been that way for a long time, ever since I had been blown up at night and felt it go out of me and go off and then come back. This, explain, what, this explains why he knows that silkworms feed all night, but it also helps us by inference to account for why he may listen to them obsessively because they help block out the more distant sound of guns and all that psychologically implies. As for the specific nature of his wounds when he was blown up, this gap remains wide open. We do learn with regard to the immediate impact of the event that his soul went out of his body and then came back again. But for most of us, we are again forced to do some filing, in, uh, filling in, sorry, I can't read. We, we are required to do some filling in since few of us have had this experience. But we think then that it was serious, that maybe he was knocked unconscious. Maybe his heart start beating, stopped beating for a little bit. Maybe he thought he was going to die. Maybe he was in, uh, feeling a massive sense of panic. Maybe he felt a sense of calm about it, but maybe now he's panicking because he thinks the minute he closes his eyes, he's going to die. There's quite a lot that we have to think about and we have to fill stuff in with our imaginations because reading a book is about as, mu as, as much about us using our imagination as it is the writer using theirs. So... The reading of narrative is a fine tissue of insertions like this that we make as we move from point to point. As, and though this can often lead to overreading, it also gives the experience of, a na of narrative much its power. In other words, the energy narrative draws on is our own. Wolfgang Isser sorry guys there's a pop-up, who wrote at length about the gaps in narrative put it this way, it is only through inevitable omissions that a story gains its dynam dynamism. 
It is only through inevitable omissions that a story gains its dynamism. Dynamism. I can't say that word. So it's only through these gaps that make it um, make it impressive, uh, dynamic. But it is also worth underscoring at this point that we have little clear we have little clear understanding of what exactly the mind does when it reads. And if filling in gaps is one of the ways the mind makes the narrative dynamic, another way is to limit this filling in, not to go too far. When Satan is described in Paradise Lost, rising from the burning lake in hell, Milton gives us uh, gives an indication of his immensity by strategically limiting the information he gives us. Then with expanded wings, he steers his flight aloft incumbent on the dusky air that felt unusual weight. He told us that Satan was 100 feet in length, had a wingspan of 85 feet and weighed roughly eight tons. Milton would not have communicated the same sense of immensity that he does in these three lines. He gains by leaving out by suggesting and not specifying. Sometimes we have to read between the lines, the subtext. We have to fill in. Satan does not fly, but steers his flight like a ship. He is weighted with the low U sounds incumbent on the dusky air. And even the air, normally so unfazed by everything and anything, felt unusual weight. So it's personified the air. As in a bad dream, we don't see but rather feel the satanic hugeness of this creature. Satan arouses awe to the degree that the reader does not fill in the descriptive details about him. Maybe we don't want to. Maybe it's too scary. So here is another interesting complication in the field of narrative. If narrative comes alive as we fill in gaps, it also gains life by leaving some of them unfilled. In the art of narrative, less can indeed be more. And that's the end of this video. Next time we'll look at Marxist ways of reading. So I hope that helped with stuff. I hope I answered a couple of questions and augmented a few things for you. If you have any questions, you know where I am. You can tweet me at Miss Hine English. You can email me. You know how to get a hold of me. Uh, stay in the house. Stay safe. Wash your hands with soap. Um, work hard. Take care. <laughs>